Hello, it's Mike from Victorious Art again. Today I'm going to be talking about the tools that you need to get started in stained glass copper foiling. I'm going to do another video that looks at the different tools that you need for leading. So we'll come back to that in another video today, just about foiling. Now, there are lots of videos, lots of information out there on the internet that tells you about most of the stuff you need for copper foiling. They do miss out quite a few useful extra things. So I'm going to talk about those extra things as well, because um, I think it might be useful. And I'm going to put a printed list, not a printed list, obviously, because it's the internet, um, but a list of the tools that I talk about today at the end of this video. Now, <clears throat> before I actually get into that, I would say if you want to get into stained glass, and I, I recommend you do, um, it's certainly been a great journey for Jenny and me at Vitris Art. I would suggest if you can, if there's somewhere near you that does it, I would go on a class or two first. I'm not saying that in order to sell you classes. You may well be watching from outer Mongolia and getting to North Hants in the UK, probably not very convenient for a one day class. I'm saying it really because all the students we've come across, pretty much all, who made a start on their own based on maybe some YouTube videos or buying a book or something, found that they needed a bit of help to get started. And quite often they've come to us and said, I'm, I'm struggling to get my glass to break properly or I can't make my soldering iron, give me smooth solder lines, that sort of thing. Um, by the time they've done a one day class with us, all of a sudden everything seems a lot clearer. They understand the why as well as the how, and then they're off making beautiful things and then possibly selling them on, it, on Etsy at craft fairs or whatever. So if you possibly can, I would suggest See if you can get yourself on a starter, beginner stained glass class. Accelerate your learning curve, that's what I'm saying. Okay, right. Um, I'm going to talk through all the tools and the various different materials you need uh, to do copper foiling. I'm going to talk through them in the order that you would use them in a project, because otherwise I'm going to forget everything. So to start off with, you need some means of cutting glass. Actually, to start off with, you need a design, but I'm going to probably look at designs in another video as well. Cutting glass. What do you need to cut glass? First, most obvious, you need a glass cutter. And we use generally the one in my left hand, that's that one, um, in case this video comes up the wrong way around. That is called a, a Toyo custom grip cutter. I've done a little video about the various different cutters you might encounter. So have a look for that and subscribe to our channel as well because there'll be other videos as well. You might also see this one. This is called a Toyo Supercutter. The essence of them is they've got a tungsten carbide wheel. Very, very hard metal. It's about the hardest material on earth, actually. Um, and it's an oil field cutter, so you don't have to dip it in paraffin or, or glass cutting oil or anything like that. You fill it with white spirit or cutting oil, and it does the job. It feeds the oil as you need it as you make your scores. So glass cutter, the advice is always buy cheap and you buy twice. So get a decent cutter to start off with. You'll waste a lot less glass, get a lot less frustrated and enjoy your rapid development in stained glass a lot more. So glass cutters, buy the best you can afford from a reputable manufacturer. We tend to use Toyo almost all the time, okay? You need some means of breaking your glass. Actually, I'll do a couple of quick scores so I've got something to actually break. I've just got to remember to position this so that you can see this on camera. Nice clean score sound will break very easily. Um, there's a couple of different tools that we would recommend. This one is the least expensive. It's pretty user friendly. It's called a glass snapper because that is exactly what it does. You put the glass in the jaws in line with the marks on the top. Squeeze and go. Nice easy tool to use. There is another tool um, that's certainly worth having. If you can possibly spring to the extra 10 or 20 quid that this one would cost you for the cut running pliers, this is, this is the baby. This one will help you cut much more advanced shapes, much deeper curves, things like that. I would probably recommend you consider getting one of these when you're starting out. Using other kinds of tools to break the glass might well cost you the difference in wasted glass pretty quickly. So you might as well get the best tool that you can. I'll show you how you use this as well. Um, some of these cutting techniques and tools are, are the subject of another video um, but seeing as we're talking about the tools you need 
we might as well mention this is this is the one to go nice easy tool to use it's good for different thicknesses of glass that's what the screw here is for and if your work requires cutting quite tight turns especially concaves this is probably the best tool to get from that glass cutting pliers cut runners actually is what they're officially called you will also need these grozing pliers nice traditional tool um, the shape of that tool is about a thousand years old. This, this one is probably only about 18 years old. Um, and you'll notice that there's a curved tool below. These are grozing pliers. They're not ordinary doing and undoing nuts pliers or gripping things pliers. These are grozing pliers. So make sure you get the right ones. They're only about seven or eight quid. So I would strongly recommend having at least two pairs. Why? Because if you're working with very small pieces of glass and you need to break two pairs, Will do the job you won't be able to physically grip the glass by hand if the pieces are very small having having an extra pair of grozing pliers is a real a real time and hassle saver so definitely get two pairs when you're buying your toolkit they last forever um, also for glass cutting don't forget you need some means of getting straight lines and these are loosely called score sticks in the trade i would suggest having a short one and a long one um, if you only buy a short one to start off with, there will come a time when you need to do longer cuts. Perhaps you're buying sheets of glass in larger sizes and you want to cut them down, in which case, if that's not at least as long as the score you want to make, you're going to have some kind of unfortunate outcome. So get the get the 20 inch one as well as the 12 inch one. And it's not a metal ruler. It's got a rubber back on the back and it's also quite a lot thicker than a metal ruler so definitely get the right tool score stick that's what you need you will also need probably a set square because if you want to make sure you've got parallel edges or right angles something like that you'll need a set square you can get well, the point about this one is it's got that ridge can you see that where my finger is that means it sits on the edge of the glass and then you get a nice straight edge but little piece of advice I would aim to do your cutting against the surface of the score stick not against the surface of the set square itself use the set square to get your score stick in the right place rather than use it as a cutting edge because these are made out of glass reinforced plastic um, and it's not a great surface to run your glass cutter along that's a, that's a horrible feel that and 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 it more often than not it doesn't work as expected especially if you're less experienced whereas the, the score stick it's got a smooth metal edge which is designed for the cut for the glass cutter to run smoothly along so that would be my little little piece of extra advice on that use the set square to position the score stick in the right place but don't use it as a cutting edge in itself okay um, one last thing you will definitely need for glass cutting is a sharpie pen. You may need to mark your design, you may need to mark your glass, we'll talk about how you do all that kind of stuff in another video. But a sharpie pen is, is the right thing to use I would say because the size of the felt tip on there is just right for creating lines for cutting on a design for stained glass. Right, okay, so that's glass cutting and breaking. Um, it is possible to do stained glass without a grinder, but I, frankly, I don't know how people achieve it. Maybe they use a Dremel, maybe they use a cover under the stone. We do have Dremels and cover under the stones, but we don't use them for grinding the glass because there is a tool intended for that purpose. Yes, it costs a bit of money, but I don't, really don't think you can do stained glass without it. And buy a good one, it'll last so long that you'll, you'll be pleased that you made a sensible investment. And what does that look like? looks like this this one is a glass star we've got five or six of these i think we use them in our in our teaching workshops uh, they do last quite a long time a couple of things to watch out for um see the head there that, that rotating head there that's the abrasive surface you use that to grind your glass so it's got a smooth edge and so that all of the pieces of your design fit together make sure you you undo this with the allen key which is supplied Make sure you undo the head and move it up and down from time to time. Because if you don't do that, it'll get locked on. All the gunge 
that builds up in there if we get locked on and you won't be able to undo it without something like they call it a faucet puller, a tap puller. It's a special tool that you use to get things off. And you can damage the bearings of the motor inside here if you have to use that. So avoid that. Put a bit of Vaseline or some sort of grease on the shaft of the rotating part of the grinder and move the head up and down from time to time. Firstly, so that you're presenting a fresh part of the abrasive surface when what you've used has worn down a bit, um, but also so that it doesn't get stuck on so firmly that you can't get it off. Because if you can't get it off and the head's knackered, you're gonna, you're gonna need a whole new grinder. New grinder is in the UK generally about 150 quid upwards. New heads are about 35 quid. Definitely pays to maintain your grinder. Keep it free of gunge from time to time. I know we're not quite as, we're, not, we're kind of, it's a say as we, it's a do as we say, not as we do. Um, but definitely buy a decent quality grinder because they last so much longer that you'll be glad that you made a sensible investment. Another thing to use with a grinder that gets overlooked is a bench hook. We make these, you can actually buy them, I think, but we make these because we might as well. Um, and the point of that is when your grinder sits on it, the bench hook sits on the bench and it means that the grinder doesn't slide around. Now we, we have carpeted benches and we have these surfaces, um, but if you're using anything else, if you're, if you're using like a wooden work table or a wooden work bench or something, having a bench hook means the grinder won't slide around so much. So I'll just show you another view of that. That's what it looks like. You can make them, you can buy them, worth having. Now, while I remember the surface that I've got here, um, technically this is called low density fiberboard. It's like medium density fiberboard, MDF, but lower density, it's more, it's more fibery, less powdery. Um, there's, a, there's a brand name, Hemosote, that you may find. I think that's probably more for our American friends. Morton sell this. Most places that do stained glass tools will sell this. I, I know that people use cork tiles made up into a, into a laminate sort of glue together, things like that. You need some kind of surface that you can cut on that's got a little tiny bit of cushioning. Um, and the reason we also use these particularly is because you can use the pins with these. I'm going to show you that in a moment. Um, you can solder on these, you can cut on these. It's like a sacrificial surface that protects your workbench. Um, but also, particularly when cutting, that slight cushion effect means the glass doesn't slide around when you're, when you're cutting it. That's, that in itself is worth paying for. So hemosote or a low density fibre board, definitely worth having. Um, so after you've ground your glass, the next thing you would do is apply the copper foil to the edge. So you will need some copper foil and on our workshops, we generally use one quarter inch wide for beginners because it's not too fiddly. It's a bit fiddly, but it's not, not terrible. Um, in our own work, we tend to use either seven thirty seconds or a size smaller down. A bit fiddly, but it gives you finer solder lines. Um, you might want to get some with a silver back like this and some with either a black or a copper back. Um, and I'm going to talk about patina just at the end and come back to the copper foil and the colour of the inside of it when we do that. But you'll definitely need some copper foil. Might be worth, as I say, starting with the slightly wider. Now, a lot of this stuff is American, so it's an imperial, so quarter inch, which is about six mil. This 730 seconds is about, it's just over five mil. I find that's better in terms of getting a, a narrower solder line. You will also need, with your foil, you'll need the tools to apply it. The main tools are your fingers, and um, you also need a pair of scissors, a craft knife and a fid. This, this, this tool is called a fid. You, they're often blue or this kind of bone colour and you use this to burnish the foil. This video isn't really about showing you how to use the tools. This video is about showing you the, the essential tools that you will need to get. Um, but suffice to say you will need these tools. Craft knife for a bit of trimming and tidying up the scissors for cutting the foil and the fid for burnishing the foil. Um, when I was talking about cutters, did I talk about the white spirit? If I didn't, I'm going to come back to that. White spirit, we tend to use that instead of cutting oil because it costs a fraction, does, this, does exactly the same job. Um, what I am also going to say is when you're ready to lay out your pieces for your foiling, this is, this is something that probably one of the more common questions we get is how do you hold all the pieces together? Now, I mentioned that we use pins on this board um, and 
these pins, they're, they're part of the Morton system. Um, these pins are really useful. They look like push pins, but they're metal, so they're a lot, a lot sturdier. And we use these um, to pin our aluminium strips. And these are also a Morton product. And you use these to make sure that what you're about to solder doesn't move around. So I've got this little piece. That's, that's just a soldering demo piece that one of us made in the last workshop we did. So you can use your pins to hold everything in place. Um, so that's another reason for this low density fiberboard surface because the pins go in that and they hold your pieces pretty firmly. Um, so you need a selection of strips. These come in packs. You can buy you can buy sort of selection packs where you get some little ones, some medium sized ones like these, and 20 inch long ones. Um, and I, I would say it's worth having a selection of all of those and a decent number of the pins that go with those as well. Um, and seeing as we seem to lose a few pins on every workshop that we do, um, we always buy from time to time, probably every other order we put into glass, we buy some more pins. Worth having quite a lot of those, just in case they get missing, and worth having a selection of the aluminium strips. I do see posts on Facebook where people say, oh, you could make those for, for, for pennies. You could, yes, but you've got, to, you've got to factor in the time taken to make them and then set up your pillar drill to drill the holes and, and so on and so on. So, you know, I, I value my time more highly than that. Up to you. When it comes to soldering, what do you need? You definitely need a decent quality soldering iron. And there's a couple of other things that people forget to tell you about, which is very remiss. You need a, a wet sponge to keep the tip clean. I would strongly recommend you get a spare tip and a spare nut if you use this kind of soldering iron. If the tip on your soldering iron, whatever kind you buy, is removable, have a spare. And what other materials or, or components are needed to replace the tip, have a spare of those. Because there's nothing more frustrating than finding that your tip has burnt through or the nut has rusted through or something like that when you've got a big project on and then suddenly you find you've got to wait three or four days or longer to get replacement bits. Have a spare in hand. Uh, for the same reason I would have a spare grinder head in hand as well. Um, so that's the soldering iron and you need a weighted stand. You can get lightweight metal stands and I think they're more of a liability than anything else. Get a decent stand. It's probably only another 10 quid. Well worth it for your safety. Um, on the subject of soldering irons, as with cutting tools, as with any tool actually, buy cheap and you buy twice. We do have students that went out and bought a tentative kit of tools and took advantage of a deal that gave them 20 quid off for a really cheap soldering iron or something like that. And then a little bit later on they find that it stopped working or the tips burnt through because it was a cheap tip or um, generally um, they find it's not hot enough or it's not powerful enough or something like that. Buy the right tools first time round and you won't have to buy them the second time round after having already spent money on lower quality tools. Buy cheap and you buy twice. Decent stand, decent iron. You need flux. There are lots of different types of flux. I think that's probably subject for another video. But buy enough flux to make sure that you won't run out halfway through a project. That's quite annoying. Um, you need something to apply your flux with and a couple of little pots. Um, if you eat enough desserts, then you'll end up with a stash of these anyway. So don't go and buy pots, just, just eat a load of desserts. Um, the other thing you might need for your soldering iron, you won't need it immediately, but you might well need it before long, um, and that's a salamoniac block. And you use that to clean the tip of your soldering iron. Now, if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you'll find actually there's a video where I talk about how you can look after your soldering iron, um, and I show you on the video how you use the salamoniac block. Well worth having one on your kit, they don't cost a lot. You don't need it all the time, but from time to time you will need it and it helps you maintain your soldering iron in peak condition. Right, um, so we've talked about soldering. We've got to the point where you've finished your piece. You might well want to apply some patina. Um, you can get copper, like this one, a bit difficult to see, partly because the glass is extremely dirty and also because this has been lying around and it's got quite tarnished. You can get copper patina and black patina. Um, if you like the look of Tiffany lamps and things like that where the, the solder has been treated so it's got a sort of antique dark grey black look, 
that's the black fatima. I, I think it's quite a nice look myself. Jenny's not convinced, but I do. Um, so you might want to get that. Now there's also, while I'm thinking about that, I would strongly recommend having some gloves on hand. Um, and I would probably recommend using those at the soldering stage as well, because the flux, whatever kind of flux you use, gel, paste, liquid, whatever, um, it's quite corrosive. You don't want it on your hands, that's for sure. You don't want it on your clothes either, because it will eat through them. Um, quite a lot of my shirts and t-shirts look like they've been attacked by moths. It's actually flux burn. <laughs> I should probably wear my apron more often. Um, so you want some vinyl or, or um, disposable gloves for when handling the flux, but you also want it when handling the patina, because the patina is also quite nasty. And also it stains, it stains anything. Um, stains your clothes, stains your hands, whatever, um, as well as staining the solder on your copper foiled pieces. So definitely wear the gloves during that. Um, you apply it with a little sponge. Last thing I'll talk about, which I think a lot of people tend to forget about, is what if you want to make some loops to hang your pieces on, maybe in the window or something like that? Um, get yourself some some wire. In order for it to be solderable, it needs to be copper or something like that, aluminium or coloured or coated or plastic wire. They won't work. You can't solder those. This stuff is nickel plated copper wire and you rub off the nickel plating where it's going to be soldered in order for the solder to form a good bond between the wire and your piece. Um, you need a pair of pliers, you also need a pair of wire cutters to cut this. So I would suggest getting those kinds of things in hand as well so that you can make some loops. It's always one of those cases where there'll be something you've forgotten to get or forgotten to order, you'll have to wait for, for the post to come in. If you get all of this stuff up front, then it's there when you need it. So I would probably make a little bit of a shopping list, go out and get it, and then you've got everything you need. So a couple more things I will just mention. A little bit of housekeeping. Not a naturally tidy person, but in a workshop, that's different. You definitely need a dustpan and brush and a receptacle for your glass offcuts and your shards. Keep a tidy workspace. The more tidy your workspace, the less likelihood of little cuts and nicks and scratches there is. And then when the time comes to clean your glass, get some pro glass cleaner like this and a microfiber cloth or two, because this does a nice job of cutting through the grease and giving you a, a decent clean finish at the end. So we talked about glass cutting tools. We talked about foiling, we talked about the grinding of the bench hook, we talked about soldering iron, buy the best that you can afford, definitely buy one that is somewhere around 370 degrees C tip temperature because that's what you want for most kinds of stained glass leading and copper foiling. Um, you need decent quality flux, you need a means of cleaning your soldering iron from time to time, you need a means of holding all your pieces. Now we do see uh, people making rigid boards and using battens nailed or screwed in to hold the pieces so that's that's okay that's a good way of holding all your pieces together but it's quite inflexible because the next time you do a piece that's a different shape or size you've got to unscrew everything redo the holes and so on using the pins and the aluminium strips on a suitable surface that accepts the pins that'll save you a lot of time a lot more flexible so that's the soldering, uh, we've talked about cleaning, we've talked about patina ring, we've talked about the copper foil. Now, I did say I would come back to this. I appreciate it's quite difficult to see this. This has got a copper patina on it. Now, with light coloured glass or clear glass, I can actually see through to the back of the foil here. Now, if I'd used copper coloured foil to begin with, I wouldn't see a silver back down here. Now, on this side, that's the natural sort of soldery, silvery colour. On this side, I put some patina on. I was probably demoing it to a, to a student, I expect. So for that reason, you can get copper-backed copper foil, and you can also get black-backed copper foil, and you use the black-backed when your intention is to patina your piece black, like you would a lamp, for example. Um, so it might be worth either thinking ahead and making sure you've got the right foil, silver-backed foil if you're going to leave the solder the, sh the shiny grey colour, copper back foil if your intention is to patina your piece copper, and black back foil if it's your intention to patina your piece black. Either have a bit of stock in like we do, 
um, or plan ahead and get the appropriate foil for your project. Definitely worth doing a little bit of thinking in advance on that respect. Maybe when you're setting out absolutely from scratch, maybe that's a that's for the next project on an expert one project. But if you plan ahead, you can save a hell of a lot of money on postage and things like that if you get the stuff you need at the start. Right, I think that's probably all the stuff I can tell you really. Um, for other kinds of work that we do, like lamps and 3D pieces and so on, we use a number, a variety of different wooden jigs to hold pieces in, in, in place when they're being soldered. I think that's a subject for another video as well. So thanks for watching. If you like what you've seen, subscribe to this video and then you'll get notified when we post other videos. In the meantime, have fun making your glass.